Hey guys, my name is Nick and welcome back to the channel and without a Codex Insight for the Thousand Suns, certainly in 2020 and nothing teased for 2021 just yet, um, do the Thousand Suns still pack a punch on the tabletop? So in this video we're going to be taking a look at the top three, in my opinion, uh, cults that we can take and what the builds of those cults would look like to try and optimise our maximum damage output. Arguably we could call this a little bit competitive. Before any of you switch away thinking I've gone completely nuts and competitive crazy, not in the slightest. Let's all be honest, the Space Marine Codex is ridiculous right now, and anyone who is not using a 9th edition codex, which is basically Space Marines and Necrons, uh, is at a very, very large disadvantage. So we need to optimise and take what we can to at least have half a chance and just to make a game of it. The last thing you want is Space Marine Eradicators wiping you off the board in turn one and having no fun. So we need to make a game of it and that's what this focus video is about. 40k 9th edition is far more about objective control and board control and racking up those points. 8th edition was far more about obliterating your enemy from afar as quickly as possible. Now we have to play the game a little bit more carefully. You've got to play the mission and you've got to watch your terrain. And that is the key to victory for 9th edition. With that said, we need to take a look at our best options for doing that. And we have 9 cults to play around with. Each cult, as a reminder, comes with a unique psychic power, a unique warlord trait and a unique sorceress arcana to add to your armory. Every sorcerer in your cult will be able to take that psychic power in addition to their existing powers from the codex. And whilst we wait for our flamers to get that 12 inch range, and while we wait for our models to get two wounds or three wounds on terminators, let's have a look at the top three cults in my opinion. Starting in third place then for me is the Cult of Time. Cult of Time's psychic power is Time Flux, the Warlord trait is Immaterial Echo, and the Sorceress Arcana is Hourglass of Manat. The Cult of Time really is about your staying power. This is about bringing models back from the dead. Well, we're already dead, we're dusty boys. But bringing models back onto the tabletop and sticking around. It's survivability and trying to outlast your opponents on those objectives. Applying these abilities to your objective scoring units to control those objectives is what the Cult of Time exceeds at. For those that don't know then, Time Flux is a warp charge of 5 and you can cast it on a Cult of Time infantry unit within 6 inches of the Psyker. You can return one destroyed model from that unit to the battlefield fully wounded and place it in coherency and if your result is an unmodified psychic test of 9+, plus, you can instead return D3 models. Now this isn't wounds, this is model. As you can see it's a very very low warp charge value so you can put it on a basic aspiring sorcerer for example and leave all of the super smites or some of the more powerful abilities on your character models and just leave your lower lower level uh, uh, aspiring sorcerers to be doing this kind of thing to the rest of their units. This stacks really nicely with a one command point new stratagem called Sorceress Infusion where if the result of the psychic test for a power was 9 or higher, now you re roll the result first before you declare that you're using this stratagem, the models unit contains any models that have lost wounds, select one and return D3 lost wounds to it. If you haven't uh, lost any models in that unit, you can return a model to that battlefield with all its wounds remaining. So again, another survivable tactic that stacks with the Cult of Time. The Warlord trait that comes with the Cult of Time is Immaterial Echo. In your Psychic phase, if the Warlord manifests a Psychic power with a test result of 9+, that Warlord can attempt to manifest an additional power. Note that that's not an unmodified roll, so if you are rolling hot and you've got plenty of modifiers in your pool from various other abilities, you can then cast another power. Not too bad, but something else is better for your Warlord trait, and we'll get onto those as we go through the video. Finally, the Sorceress Arcana then is Hourglass of Manat, and the first time a model with that relic is destroyed, you can bring that model back with D3 wounds remaining. Really, really good on Demon Princes, for example, that you're being very aggressive with. Suddenly, your 200-point model that gets killed can come back 
pretty easily and just save you those uh, lost points. So again, that's really nice for the uh, survivability factor, keeping your models on the table, trying to take those objectives and stick around. That's what the Cult of Time is about. But for me, it is number three in comparison to two other cults, which we'll get onto next. Second place for me then is the Cult of Magic. Cult of Magic has been around uh, and quite powerful for a while, but since 9th edition, this has now been demoted to second place for me. But that doesn't stop me wanting to use it regularly, and I'll show you how I plan on using it in my future games. Psychic Power then is Astral Blast, the Warlord trait Devastating Sorcery, and the Sorceress Arcana is Arcane Focus. All three of those got to be taken with your Cult of Magic. They are all awesome. As a reminder then, or those that don't know, Astral Blast is a warp charge value of 6. If manifested, the closest enemy unit within 9 inches and visible to the Psyker will suffer D3 mortal wounds, and each other unit within 3 inches of that unit suffers a mortal wound. And with Brotherhood of Sorcerers, that gives us an extra 6 inches of range on that, giving us a 15 inch uh, target uh, for this blast effect uh, mortal wound output. That's why it was super popular in 8th edition. Lots of castle style armies were knocking around. Everyone was all bunched up and you could impact a number of units very, very easily with a single psychic power. Combined with the Warlord trait then of Devastating Sorcery, when the Warlord manifests a psychic power that inflicts one or more mortal wounds on an enemy unit, increase that by one. So your D3 mortal wounds becomes D3 plus one, and your splash damage from Astral Blast becomes two flat mortal wounds. Very, very handy given all of the Primaris Marines are all two wounds. In fact, all of the uh, Firstborn Marines have all gained two wounds. Everyone's got two wounds. So inflicting a double mortal wound area blast is that bit more powerful. Finally, Arcane Focus then, when the Psychic Test is taken for a model with that Relic, you add one to the total. That means that you're getting off uh, Astral Blast, for example, on a raw power of five rather than six. But there's ways to improve that as well, and we'll get to that with my character build. In the number one slot, basically this becomes number one because of ninth edition and objective scoring units. The Cult of Duplicity is now top of the list for your cult choice and this comes with uh, Sorceress Facade, Duplicitous Tactician and Perfidious Tome. As I said earlier getting around the board now for board control for various secondary objectives and I will do a video on preferred secondary objectives uh, for the Thousand Suns in a future date. Warp Charge value of 7 if manifested a Cult of Duplicity unit now that could be any unit uh, within 6 inches of the Psyker, now bear in mind that's 12 inches with Brotherhood of Sorcerers, remove that unit from the battlefield and set it up anywhere else on the battlefield more than 9 inches away from an enemy model. And that unit is treated as having moved this turn. Thousand Suns are pretty slow on the whole. Getting units around the board for some of these scoring opportunities, this gives us that extra bit of movement that we need to launch a unit anywhere around the board. Warp Charge value of 7 Seems quite an average number. It is the average of 2d6, which is what you're casting on. But there are some ways to boost that with various abilities and stratagems to try and make it a bit more of a guaranteed result. Traditionally, to yeet a model up the board is uh, how the kids say it, I believe. We would typically rely on Dark Matter Crystal, which is a one-time use ability. With Sorceress Facade, we've now got the ability to do this multiple times. Even though it is a warp charge of 7, still very very cool what makes duplicity extra special then is the warlord trait of duplicitous tactician at the start of the first battle round before the first turn begins so at this point you know who's going first and second select up to d3 cult of duplicity units from your unit uh, from your army remove those units and the warlord from the battlefield and set them up again following the normal deployment rules for those units if you deploy or redeploy a transport model, the units inside that transport are also reset up again. The powerful part of this is the ability to control the centre of the board with a couple of extra stratagems. And this works really well with Risen Rubrique for one command point. When you set up a, Riz, uh, a Rubric Marine unit from your army during deployment, that unit can be set up anywhere on the battlefield more than 9 inches from the enemy deployment zone and enemy models. 
and you can do that outside of your deployment zone. So this is your massive blob of 20 rubric marines sat on a key objective for that specific mission. However, if you find then that you are going second, you can simply cult of duplicity, duplicitous tactician, and remove them away. If you find you're going first, then you can leave them there. That is the key part of this ability. With alternating deployment now, sticking that huge unit of uh, rubric marines straight up the middle of the board is going to put your opponent on the back foot immediately. If they are fortunate enough to be then going first, you can get them the hell out of there and then react accordingly, sticking them behind cover, terrain, wherever, just get them out of there so that you don't have to worry about it. They're going to try and target that unit uh, with all of their uh, future deployments to make sure they can remove it. In the meantime, you know full well they're probably not going to be there if you're going second. That's a very, very powerful ability, let's be honest. But if you do go first, you can then absolutely wang on a load of defensive uh, buffs and powers like Weaver of Fates and Glamour of Zinch. Make them minus one to hit, plus one on their invulnerable save, and you're golden. Finally then, just to round up duplicity, we do get the Sorceress Arcana of Perfidious Tome. At the end of the battle round, roll a d6 if the model with this relic is on the battlefield. On a 1, your opponent gains a command point. On a 4, you gain a command point. We're not going to be using that in the Cult of Duplicity. We are solely relying on Sorcerer's Facade and Duplicitous Tactician. And then we will be taking a different Arcana. And I'll get onto that uh, in a second uh, when we cover some of the builds that I'm talking about here. So, what are we talking about with our detachments then? We are going to be taking a Battalion that is the Cult of Duplicity and a Patrol Detachment, which is the Cult of Magic. That is your big Mortal Wound Boomstick. Obviously you need to be able to take two detachments, so we're talking incursion and strike force levels rather than combat patrol when it comes to your army build. And as a reminder, this is our battalion minimum build, so 2 to 3 HQs, 3 to 6 troops, that is our minimum and everything else is optional. And when we're talking about our patrol detachment, that is 1 to 2 HQs and 1 to 3 troops. And we're going to try and keep this as cheap as possible but maximise our mortal output from the Astral Blast and various other abilities. Note that taking a second detachment, a second patrol detachment, is going to cost us 2 CP because our Warlord is in the other detachment. And just for completion, we're talking the Incursion and Strike Force here. Ideally, you want to be playing this with Strike Force. You can do it at Incursion levels, but we're talking large, well, the, the old regular style game, 1750 to 2000 points, we have 12 CP to play for, uh, we've already spent 2. Now some of this is a little bit CP heavy to start with, but every command phase, remember, we do get a CP back per turn. So this is what we're going to be putting in our Cult of Duplicity. We're going to be talking Exalted Sorcerers, Araman and Demon Princes. Bear in mind Araman does not gain the abilities from the Duplicity Cult, but he is such a badass you don't want to leave home without him. Then we're talking our big units of Rubrics. We're also talking Scarab Occult Terminators, and then whatever vehicles and monsters you wish to take as uh, per taste. So my three HQs for my Cult of Duplicity then are an Exalted Sorcerer here on the left, Araman in the middle, a Demon Prince with wings, and dual Malefic Talons on the right hand side. So this is my build for the Exalted Sorcerer. He will be my Warlord. He's going to be taking Duplicitous Tactician, the Dark Matter Crystal, Sorcerer's Facade, Weaver of Fates, Glamour of Zinch, and comes in at 120 points. Remember that Sorcerer's Facade, which is the Cult of Duplicity special power, is in addition to two other powers he knows. And I'm taking the Weaver and Glamour, because his job is to defensively buff that big unit of 20 rubrics that I mentioned earlier. His Sorcerer's uh, Arcana, then, is the Dark Matter Crystal. This is another movement ability to throw a unit up the board, uh, to uh, gain some of that board control or objective control. The Demon Prince then is our beat stick. He is one of our tougher combat units in this build. Two Malefic Talons, Wings, Gaze of Fate, Prescience, and it comes in at 200 points. The Gaze of Fate from uh, Zinch's powers. Remember that you have to go through every Psyker first before you mix and match where your powers are coming from. The order of casting is very important here. Gaze of Fate is basically a free reroll for a very low warp charge. This is the one that you're going to be doing first, and prescience on your unit of choice, something that is going to be getting that bonus to hit. 
So my example list here is going to have 20 rubrics in one squad, 10 in another, in a rhino, and then five just to hold a backfield objective. We're also going to be running two squads of five-man Scarab Occult Terminators. And then finally, really, a vehicle or a monster of your choice. I'm favouring right now Contempt to Dreadnoughts. Uh, with last cannons, you really do want to be able to have some decent ranged output. Um, but other people might want to go with Forge Fiends, or they might want to go more combat with Mauler Fiends, or even Defilers. You've got around about 200 and something points to play with in this list uh, as is, and that slot can be taken with your preferential unit. Now for the Cult of Magic, we are taking a Terminator Sorcerer, and then a cheap unit of your choice. That could be Cultists, uh, Zangors, or 5 Rubrics. The Cultists will cost you 60 points for 10, Zangors and Rubrics will cost you 90 points. The Terminator Sorcerer is only 118 points. You're talking around about a 200 point detachment in total. I don't actually have a Terminator Sorcerer, so here's one I grabbed off of Forge World. This is their Legion Praetor from the Horus Heresy. Makes a very, very good Terminator Sorcerer model. It's one of the ones I do need to add, but I can temporarily substitute in one from the Scarab Occult, but you do want him to look a bit cooler, so I'd recommend that. So what are we building this Sorcerer with? We are giving him Arcane Focus, which is plus one to cast from the Cult of Magic. This is a second Arcana, so that will cost you one command point, though. Devastating Sorcery. This is his Warlord trait. Again, this is going to cost you a command point to achieve by using a stratagem called Magister from the Psychic Awakening book. For 10 points, we're going to equip him with a Familiar, which gives him plus one to cast his first power in every Psychic phase. We're then going to be looking at two options for Psychic Stratagem buffs. The first one is a Chaos Familiar, and that's going to give us access to Zinch's powers, and we're going to be taking Infernal Gateway. Then for two command points, Cabalistic Focus gives us plus two to cast once we're in range of two other Psychers. So outside of Cabalistic Focus, if you're keeping track, we've now spent two command points on the second detachment, and then we've spent two more command points on the uh, extra Relic and extra Warlord trait, and then we're adding another point for the Chaos Familiar, so keeping track of how many command points we are investing already here. So why are we taking the Sorcerer in the first place and not putting this on any other model? And that is because of the Chaos Familiar. It's the only unit in the Codex that can give us that plus one to cast. And the reason we need that is because we're taking Infernal Gateway. Now this is a second Uber Blast of Mortal Wound goodness. So this is a Warp Charge of eight, and if manifested, identify the nearest enemy model within 12 inches of the Psyker, which becomes 18 with Brotherhood. And what happens here then is that model's unit and every unit within 3 inches, which can be friend or foe, just be warned, uh, of that model suffers D3 mortal wounds. So even a bit more powerful than Astral Blast, potentially. The number of mortal wounds inflicted goes to D6 if the power manifested with a psychic test of 12+. plus. So we need to buff this guy to the max to try and get ourselves to 12+. plus, Or as a bare minimum, an easy route to get to 8. Now this is already stacking with our devastating sorcery. So this is already D3 mortal wounds plus 1 to the target unit and D3 plus 1 to surrounding units. If you get then D6 because you're a psychic test of 12+, plus, that's D6 plus 1 to everybody. This is an anti-castle uh, super strat. And of course, because he's a Terminator, he deep strikes and you haven't got to spend any CPs on any outflanking abilities. He can be put where you need him to be put to apply this damage. So you can now see why I'm trying to get as many plus one abilities to our psychic test. Arcane Focus is giving us plus one. The Familiar is giving us plus one. So this now becomes a warp charge in effect of six. And then you can add in Cabalistic Focus, which does cost you a command point. It is a stratagem. Uh, that then makes this a 4 plus to cast. And then if you're going to go for the D6 damage, you only need an 8. So slightly above average to even get to the 12 plus here. That combination, and you can do two powers, is a mortal wound machine. And that is why we're talking 118 points plus some CP investment Depending on who you're playing here, if you're facing like a Tau Castle or something along those lines, 
and you appear and unleash a bucket load of mortal wounds, this is why the small little detachment that's going to cost you some investment is so powerful. And obviously you need to get a couple of units nearby, a couple of sorcerers nearby for Kabbalistic Focus to work. That's where the two Scarab Occult Terminator units come in, or even the Demon Prince. They've got super maneuverability, they can get in range of him, and then you can, uh, you can power up. In the meantime, your uh, Duplicity army is marching all over the board, doing what it needs to do to secure those points. So that's my thoughts on the most powerful cults in the game for the Thousand Suns and how I would build specifically around them. So we have a hyper-maneuverable cult of duplicity that can really dominate and dictate deployment and those early stages of the game. And then we have our super powerful mortal wound magic blasting unit that's only going to set you back sort of less than a couple of hundred points realistically if you take the, uh, the cultist and the terminator. And he is just going to have that potential output for very little investment other than some CPs. And remember, we do get those CPs back. You're still going to end up with sort of five or six at the starting blocks uh, to avoid uh, things like um, uh, Perils of the Warp, where we can negate that with one command point. Or you want to apply some of the other abilities um, to the rest of your army. So this for me is probably the, the toughest build that I can potentially come up with. I'd love to hear from you in the comment section what you think. Do you think this is about right? Do you think this is probably the arguably the best combination we can get out of our Thousand Suns? Or do you think there's room for some other things? I'd love to hear from you in the comment section below. Uh, but if you like this video, uh, don't forget to like, comment and subscribe. And I shall catch you guys on the next video.